Hi guys, welcome back to Radical Self-Belief, the Mojo Maker podcast. I'm your host, Nikki Fogdemore, and I always get slightly excited when I have special gurus on my show that are truly living a life they love. And through hard work, blood, sweat, and tears, they come out making it look so easy on the surface, but what lies beneath is a lot of grit, determination, and usually lifelong stories. Today's episode, I have one of the gods of fishing, uh, Ryan Moody, who together with his wife, Karen, have put together the most successful online program for teaching you how to fish smarter um, and it's quite an amazing story that he's got so I'm really excited to dive straight into this episode and get you right in the heart of the action with Ryan on today's show a couple of admin points if you haven't already please like and subscribe radical self-belief the mojo maker podcast is on Spotify iTunes Google and everywhere else it'll also ensure that you get updates from this episode with Ryan and I will put show notes links to Ryan's website and all sorts of helpful tips that we discuss on this episode episode in the episode show notes on my website Nikki Fogg do more and if you've got questions and you love this episode and you'd like to hear more we'd love to hear from you so just leave us a comment and leave us a review we're eternally grateful we make a free podcast here to help you get in the driver's seat of life as well as this time we've actually done some listener questions pre pre ahead of recording this and I'm really excited so at the end of this episode we're going to bring a couple of questions in from Truck and from Dino, and I think also from Paul, they wrote some questions in that I could ask Ryan on the show. So without further ado, let's get into the episode of The Business of Fishing with Ryan Moody, and I'd like to welcome my very special guest sitting there in Cairns, uh, off the water by chance. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Nikki. A pleasure to be here. Uh, it's pretty exciting. I remember um, it all sort of happened out of the blue, um, and then I ended up going fishing with you a few weeks ago in Cardwell, which is your home turf, that beautiful, expansive ocean out there. And we were chatting uh, on the boat around the fact that to all intents and purposes, Ryan, it looks like you just snapped your fingers and created RyanMoodyFishing.com. And then it was just a, a blessed approach. But really, this has been a lifelong thing in the making. Yeah, it'd be nice if magic wands existed, wouldn't it? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Especially been, with fishing. Yeah, a lot of blood, sweat and tears. Um, and yeah, I think well, people obviously don't know what goes on behind the scenes, of course, and that's with anybody's business. But uh, on the surface, things look great. Looks like we go fishing and have a ball. But there's a lot of hard work and, you know, lots of challenges to build a business like this. And I think fishing as an industry, like any industry, this has just become one of those businesses that unless you are aware of it, you don't realize how massive an industry it is uh, and how much of a following it has worldwide. And it's not only a lifestyle, but it's also a profession for so many. And fishing for you was a profession for many, many years, Ryan, when you ran charters. So tell us a little bit about how you, I think even your brother brother got started into fishing in the first place. And that's probably the point that we should kick off the story is why fishing and how did it all begin? Well, how it all began was, uh, well, dad was a, a mad keen um, fisherman and loved boats and all that sort of thing. He used to have little, uh, make these little homemade speed boats back in the day and used to run it down the Ross River and it had a Peugeot motor in it and they used to spray the trains. It used to do like 70 mile an hour or something on the water. It's a crazy looking thing. He called it the tarantula. So he loved um, boats in the water from the start and he got us into it as well and um, he'd take us fishing every weekend nearly when the weather was good or he'd at least take us to the island and we'd go snorkeling and rock climbing and all sorts of things at off Townsville there and but fishing was the number one thing and um, he wasn't he 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 preferred to just go mackerel fishing and troll a couple of big cord lines behind the boat with spoons that was his style of fishing um, not knowing where when and why and, and all this, this sort of thing but he just knew that if he went somewhere over near the Cape and trolled some lines, we'd catch mackerel. And back in those days, of course, the fish docks were insane and it was easy, but it got us keen and led to the life on the water. And I also, he, he took me down and put me on one of the uh, old Marlin boats many years ago when I was a young fella. I think it was called Tough Nut in Townsville. There wasn't many around back then, um, but I always wanted to work on a Marlin boat from the age of about seven or eight. And um, eventually that did happen. So 
I eventually progressed, went through school. Um, I, I did leave school a bit early, grade 10, and I went and worked on some mackerel boats. Uh, then I progressed from the mackerel boats to uh, the game fishing boats. i uh, done that for a number of years, uh, light tackle at Cape Bowling Green and uh, back in its heyday when there was, you'd see 60 to 80 sailfish a day or more, you know, and marlin and little marlin. And then we'd go and do the heavy tackle up north as well. And, and a little bit off Townsville too, out at Mermidon Reef. And basically in the last few years I was doing that was when I got married and we started having children. So that's when I sort of, the last few years I was marlin fishing, we, in the off season, I was establishing the barramundi fishing charters. And then eventually I gave the game fishing away and just focused solely on my business alone. And uh, at one stage there towards the end, we had uh, two barra fishing boats operating and I also had an eight metre centre console out of Townsville. That was back in the day when I first discovered wonky holes. And once again, my dad helped me with that because he was actually a very well known and very successful water diviner, oh, finding wow. the water trails and that. So he taught me all about how the underground and artesian uh, waterways work. Mm. And of course, we always heard about the trawlers hooking up on these things. The trawlers gave them the nicknames wonky holes, but um, they're actually underground aquifers, uh, springs that come up. There's two different sorts. And um, I put two and two together, had a swim on one. Uh, yeah, and just understood where they came up and all that sort of thing. And basically we've turned that into a course these days. So I was one of the first people to ever really understand and fish uh, wonky holes. So, and from there, mate, yeah, we've um, 33 years in the charter industry. And then basically we changed uh, track uh, basically because I was getting a bit older and those uh, five and six days on the water a week were starting to take a bit of a toll when you reach the age of 50. So it was time for a change and that's when Karen and I got together and came up with uh, the online courses. So yeah. yeah, it's a bit of a journey. Bit of a journey. I think what's really interesting as well, there's fishing as a, as a topic is a little bit of a polarizing topic, especially when you discuss trawlers and everything else going on with the sustainability in our planet. And one of the things I love about you and Karen is you have a very sustainable, uh, responsible approach and you're actually trying to educate on how do we nurture the planet and understand the systems rather than just going out for volume and there's no bravado behind it. So this intelligence you know that you've you know harvested through from your dad and uh and kind of you know had the initiative to consider the the lower structure of the earth if you like and how that all sits on the planet of the ocean and then provide an opportunity for people to fish smarter um mm. as a business idea because when you were doing your charters you were saying to me that people would come out for three days and there was so much pressure because you would be expected to put them straight onto fish, right? So, yes. but this ocean is, you know, hundreds of kilometers in, in one area. And then if you've got nowhere to go before Garmin and Lawrence and everything else were invented, it was a bit like a needle in the haystack. So the whole philosophy of fishing, the whole business of fishing, it's a billion, multi-billion dollar industry. And you're trying to, through your focus, carve a niche out to provide individual people a skill that means they can fish responsibly, uh, create a legacy, and have a better understanding of the interaction between nature and, and ourselves in that process. Would you say that summarizes it pretty well? Oh, definitely, mate. We do teach a lot about sustainability in our courses as well and, and in the study groups and things like that. And, and one of the main things that why we love doing it and teaching people all this kind of thing is the fact that dads can pass it on to their kids and take their kids out and get them interested and get them away from computer games and all the rubbish, you know, the, from television screens and all that sort of stuff and get them back into the outdoors because, you know, there's a, a lot of behavioral problems with, you know, as the generations get on. And I think a lot of it is the people are missing the outdoors. They're not just not getting outdoors enough. They're living too much of an artificial life yep. behind the scenes, you know, and yep, totally. we were born to roam wild. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. And I think what's really great about our discussions and just to earmark on that, we're actually going to be doing a whole episode together around men's mental health and the importance of creating, um, you know, gathering, hunting, providing just an individual viable 
aspect and what that actually does in a family. So what I wanted to do is actually just bring us back to the fact that you've actually built together with Karen, who's your highest motivator and cheerleader and probably hard taskmaster. I know Karen, she doesn't let up. Yeah, so good on her. Good on her is you've <laughs> built an empire mm. from taking something you do on the water and putting it online. So tell us a little bit about why you decided to, you know, bring your knowledge into this online program of Fish Smarter and the Ryan Moody Fishing Academy, really, isn't it? Yes, yes. Well, when I was on charter only years ago before Karen and I got together and all that, I was always very secretive around you know everything I kept everything close to my chest and and of Spots. course when you yes <laughs> and techniques and things that we develop and, yeah. and stuff like that because when you spend time on the water you see things that people take a long time to catch up on basically and average angler who might fish once every weekend well once every fortnight weekend sort of thing it's um you know, you just can't learn all these things that happen on the water and see these little triggers and then and, and then try these little experiments and see if it works, you know. And of course, that's what I'm lucky enough to have had the time to do. So yeah, it's um basically we yeah, just eventually worked out all these different bits and pieces. And then we decided, well, uh, I lost my well, I lost my best mate to melanoma and I was starting to get a bit exhausted every week. Uh, especially approaching 50 years old and uh, so Karen and I got together and we thought well you know you, you are starting to struggle a bit you know my, my fitness wasn't bad it was just the sun I was really starting to really really get affected from the sun and um, and and even these days of course we still go out in the sun but it's not six days a week yeah yeah so anyway we decided that it was time to get me off the water and what could we do to uh, supplement an income or start a new business? And Karen said to me, how would you feel about, you know, giving away your life's secrets, your life's work and stuff like that? And I said, well, realistically, I'm towards the end of my career and nothing's really a secret anymore. So, yeah, I, I don't mind. So, we, yeah, we put our heads together and came up with the online courses idea and we're the first ones in the world to, to do it and started taking the steps, of course. And, and uh, then as we dissolved into it, we, I was still doing charters. That was the thing. I couldn't just stop and then start because we had to think about a lot of things. You know, is this a risk? Is this going to work? Um, because it had never been tried before, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and I, I had a fairly high profile in the fishing industry back then anyway. So something like this you you can't just be average joe who's not known at all you would just fail straight away and luckily i've got the runs on the board to be able to do something like this and uh so anyway we we started off with me still doing charters and we started structuring the programs how we thought they would be structured with the conceptual videos and then the infield videos to back up the scenarios and ideas we're talking about and techniques and things um, but, but I would, I'd come home from charters and then I would edit all the video. I learned editing, Karen done all the websites and all the background and learned Facebook marketing and everything else and all kinds of marketing. And I, I would stay up till two or three in the morning, sometimes editing videos. Mm. Um, and, uh, and we'd go and film uh, on my days off from charter, we'd go and film and then I'd, you know, edit after that. Um, and then, some, you know, I'd be back up at five o'clock, six yeah. o'clock going on charter again. So I was living on two, three, four hours sleep a night per over a year yeah. to, did, to get did it you going. Have self, like when you were going through this process, because you're obviously putting yourself out there, it's fishing, not catching, right? But you have a certain, people have a certain expectation. Did you feel that at certain points I'm not good enough or how did you cut, get through those kind of personal doubts because that's a lot of work and then you don't yeah. know the outcome right so you just have to trust your gut that's right how did I get through it um I guess to start with yeah I mean there was obviously doubts like I said we didn't know whether this sort of thing would work it never been attempted before um but we heard of online courses as there was all sorts of online courses for various things and of course it's getting very very popular nowadays uh, but as far as teaching a recreational product, there was 
really nothing out there, especially with fishing. And we thought, well, let's give it a go. And yeah, I mean, there was plenty of anxious moments and, you know, sleepless nights. I wasn't sleeping much anyway. Yeah. But yeah. And I, I guess... What about the moments as well when you're filming, then you realize you don't have the sound on or, oh, you know, yes. I mean, you look like it's, it's all those things, right? And you get back and you've just been out for six hours filming and you realize the camera was pointed the wrong way or something because you just. Well, that's the thing. We had to not only learn how to build websites and structure the whole programs, we had to learn filming, editing, marketing, the whole lot, you know. And there was a few times where Karen's, be I'm the cameraman. I know how to use cameras and that. But, and, and whereas Karen's not so fluent with cameras and that sort of thing. But yeah, there was some times we went out there and the sound jack wasn't quite all and, the way in. She never yeah. pressed it all the way in or... We forgot to do the sound test yeah. beforehand. Yeah. And yeah, I know, I know that feeling. I remember once yeah. there's a great mate of mine, Paul de Gouda, and we did this interview in, in Los Angeles and that my photographer was filming, but she put it on time lapse instead of oh, no. record. So I, yeah. it was, he, he put such effort into getting to this interview. And to this day, Paul, if you're listening to this, I've always been just so horrified. I couldn't be ready to tell you we could never really use it because it was just this time-lapse interview. And yeah. it was such a good interview too. You know, <laughs> At least it but, went quickly. <laughs> yeah. So it was pretty funny. But, yeah, I think that's the great thing. You know, you've built an empire now. Um, you know, it's a million-dollar business. You have got a community which is heartfelt and connected and you're getting this cut through. But the level of maintenance and hours it's taking to actually run this machine. So you got it all set up and then you started – getting out there because you had that niche, you knew what to say to people, but then it kind of grew bigger than you expected, didn't it really? Oh, it did. It, um, yeah, we didn't expect to create the monster that we did. <laughs> and uh, of course you got to roll with the punches and then you got to expand and more courses. And um, yeah, I think, and, and during the journey, you think about things like how, uh, what are we doing? What can we do better basically when we do film these things? And even today, with the better cameras and that that are coming out and drones and things. And I'm very good with the drone now. Uh, we're actually going to go back and refilm some of the videos from the courses just to make them that little bit better, you know? Yeah, very good. Yeah. So there is a massive learning curve in many, many respects to take on to do something like we've done. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's just um, time, I guess, and commitment. Um, you know, there has been a, a few people now since that have seen us and, kind of um, tried to do what we do, but they've, they've thrown their hands in the air and walked away from it quick smart because yeah. it is, it's very, very, it hasn't been an easy road for us. Um, no. What have been your biggest days. challenges then? If it hasn't been an easy road, and I'll touch back on the whole YouTube community shortly about the mental health issues with keeping up with content, but what would be a couple of your biggest challenges that perhaps no one would know about because they don't really get, you know, behind the scenes? Yeah, well, like we mentioned before, I think it was just basically learning all these new things, um, especially when you're tired and run down, to try and take things in. It's just like, you know, you're falling asleep while you're trying to learn something. <laughs> uh, that was probably my biggest challenge. Um, but luckily, uh, Karen, uh, with all the background stuff, she's done a lot of that. And she's very, very intellectual. And she was getting more sleep than me. So <laughs> she took on a lot of that kind of thing, whereas I was more of the editing and um, and being the presenter and becoming a better presenter and, and learning how to structure um, from start to finish each module in a course. Yeah. So it made it easy for people to understand. Uh, not a whole heap of convoluted gobbledygook. We try and structure it so that it's in layman's terms so that everybody has a chance. Not everybody can learn the same. Some people no. learn easy, some people learn difficult. So we've had to, we cater for everybody. Yeah, and then one of the other things that I wanted to talk to you about is price point, right? Because you really got to put a value on yourself, Ryan. You're like, what's Ryan worth? It's not yeah. like you're, making, you're selling a widget, you're selling your expertise and those tens of thousands of hours on the water, which are your, your premier league experience. experience then you had to it. think about pricing it and and have that discussions and stand behind those prices so how do you feel that journey has gone for yourself in building the empire and pricing your courses i think it's gone pretty well um of course um well we probably think they're a little bit too cheap 
it's been my life life's work and stuff like that but uh you know, I mean barrel basics is you know 1499 now and um it it um of course when we started it was a little bit cheaper but we've added a lot of stuff since then yeah. and originally we were going to do a basic course and then we we're going to do an advanced course but <laughs> what happened was basically as we built the course the first one the basic one we thought hang on i'm starting to, i'm just spilling the beans all the time on all the advanced or some of the better stuff you know so we decided to just make it all the one course and then at the end we we put the advanced module in there where we teach you know people how to catch giant barramundi out in the middle of nowhere away yeah. from snags and rock yeah. bars and even creeks and rivers you know and we catch them off the surface out in 10 meters of water in the middle of nowhere i know i was like when we were out at turkey beach and up before i was looking at all these sandy i was going wow it's amazing to think that we've always been conditioned to think the barrel be creeks and rivers and snags and these murky areas but they really love this shallow pristine clear they're amazing they're amazing fish actually because they're so I know they're just so aggressive and clever and they're so elusive, I guess. So you, you started a course about a very elusive fish. Let's put it that way. Oh, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. And even, even threadbin salmon, they're even more um, uh, convoluted than barramundi, yeah. so to speak. So, yeah. Well, yeah. That, that, so that pricing and you spoke about that. And then I want to just talk to you about community. You know, you and Karen are very real and authentic and what you see is what you get. Um, and that has assisted in the genuine approach and your level of professionalism and quality, but you care about your clients. So how would you say keeping and nurturing that community means most of those people come back and they buy within the memberships and the other courses because there's a sense of trust there? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm old school, of course, and um, yeah, I don't believe in making a persona and like you do see a lot of people carry on and, and that what you see is what you get with me, whether you like it or not. Um, and yeah, we, yeah, it's just, uh, I think you just got to be yourself really. I mean, you, you see some people on, you know, fishing shows and things like that, they, they carry on a bit. And, and of course you hear a lot of people talk about them saying, you know, he's a such and such. And anyway, I don't get involved with all that, but, um, but yeah, I think it, no matter what you do, you just got to be true to yourself and, and yeah, don't change the way you are for anybody to think you're going to do anything better, you know, and, and the community's taken that on. Like that's some of the, you know, the, the comments on that, that we get and emails and that saying people just, we love what you do. You're down to earth, you know, you're not full of rubbish, mm. um, that kind of thing. And, and I think that's one of our successes is we just be ourselves and yeah one of our successful points is well, i always um, say you can't build towers on quicksand you know exactly. so, yeah. and i think fundamentally facebook instagram all these platforms they could be taken away at any minute oh but, definitely you know traditional businesses that are founded in good quality people and foundations they will always people always find their way to you yes uh, yeah. and so i want to just loop back to a couple of listener questions i think it's a great time for them so dean uh, he actually has a, I think, a, a boat up in WA, but he's also on the Sunshine Coast. He says, have fish uh, stocks changed over the years, Ryan? And has the introduction of green zones been a factor for this? Um, it's, I think fish stocks, uh, yeah, I don't think they're definitely as good as they used to be, but, you know, it's still pretty good. Um, I think the, the fisheries management has lacked in some areas over the years. Um, but they've sort of tightened it up. They should have tightened it up a little bit earlier because way back in the day, you know, the bag limits were 30, uh, 30 of each reef species per person per yeah. day. So realistically, one person could come back with 150 fish. You know, it was just insane. And they just let it get away because I had no idea how sustainable fisheries were. And, and, and that back in those days, they never had the research. So yeah. that was their first attempt at bag limits. And of course, now look at the bag limits we've got now. Mm -hmm. They are more realistic. Yeah. And, and, and Mother Nature is a big protector. Um, like this year, you know, I can hear the waves crashing on the beach now. It's just been 20 to 30 knots now for the last, yeah. you know, three, four, four and a half months. I know we were up there at Stanwich in that like last week. <laughs> There's no way, you know, 
we're not getting out there in that weather. Yeah, you're Mother Nature, you're right. What and then what about the green zones? How you know people understand there are green zones, but then we don't really understand specific placement of those green zones or what species they're trying to cultivate in the area. So do you think those have been a, a positive factor to re-establishing our stocks and the environment as well? Oh, definitely. And right from the start, when that first started, we were the guinea pigs for all the marine sanctuaries in Australia up in North Queensland here with the introduction of the Great Barrier Marine Park green zones and yellow zones. And even at this very start, I mean, I mean, a lot of people were against it and I was against it too, to the level that they wanted to bring it in. I just, I didn't want to see 33% shut down um, green zones and then you've got preservation zones and scientific research zones as well where you can't go. And uh, it, it's, it seems to, I mean, we do have a lot of area that's, that's closed and it has caused some displacement issues. So everybody's in a smaller area. Uh, so in some respects, some areas have been a little bit fished out now because of it. Um, but that's the whole thing too. You know, you've, you've got to move around and find new spots and, and that sort of thing. And, and, and with our wonky holes, uh, I think the thing, the best thing about bringing people's awareness to those is, is they're spending a lot of time during the day traveling around looking for them, but they're not all going to the barrier reef and fish, fish, fish. It's, yeah the wonky holes has taken a lot of pressure off the barrier reef. Yeah, well, I can, so I can attest to that. We were at, uh, about 55 k's offshore at Turkey Beach near that shoal, and all we were doing was just trying to find structure and, and these little underground estuaries. Like we were fixated on, you know, th that sort of strategy rather than just, you know, it is a needle in the haystack, but it's really interesting. So it brings the science behind the fishing and a better understanding for our planet and, and where yeah. there's nursery species and everything else and kind of a respect for that. So I think um, I think there's a really great answers and honest answers too. You know, there's always got to be a middle ground and we have to do a blend of now and what's coming next for future generations. Do you exactly. have a bucket list species and location? If you were to go, Nikki, this is just, this is what I, this is my bucket list species and this is where it's my bucket list location. What would that be? Oh, I've always wanted to go and catch a giant tarpon over in Florida. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I hope I'm not in a, a wheelchair or have a walking stick by the time I get to go and do that. But that is one thing I would really love to go and do. Um, but there's, there's a lot of smaller things within Australia. You know, I haven't really fished a lot for many of the southern species and that. Mm -hmm. um, even though I, I know I could go and catch them very easily because many foraging species have the same habits. And that's where our finger mark course has um, been helping a lot of anglers down south uh, catch snapper and um, dewfish and all sorts of things. And, uh, and it's given them a whole new perspective and a different way of looking. And now they're catching fish down there um, outside the times they normally traditionally fish, out different areas they'd never even thought of or to look at topography wise. Uh, so the finger mark course is going very, very well so many other species um particularly down south as well so yeah that's that's worked out very well so ryan you and karen have built a brand you've built an empire uh off water about what you do on water with your thousands of hours of fishing how many fish would you say you've caught thousands out like is there a number everyone talks about the tennis balls they hit and the thousands of hours on the guitar when you become a genius what is your genius fish number by now Oh, <laughs> well, back in the day, we used to have to keep logbooks with Queensland fisheries. And then it ceased after not long before I retired. Oh, a few years before I retired now, then. And uh, uh, I think back towards the end of it, I think I'd caught something around about 30,000 barramundi. And we've got 2,135 uh, or something now over a metre long. Uh, not me, of course, that's clients. <laughs> Um, and when you think about the number of threadfin salmon, the amount of finger mark, the reef species, oh, I really couldn't put a number on it at no. all. Yeah. But true genius things. What were we going to say? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, we, and a lot of those fish are released too, of course. Yeah. Uh, especially the initial fish, the big barramundis and, and all that sort of thing. And as long as it's not, it's not too deep, we, we even release nanny guy and things like that as well um so as long as they haven't got barotrauma and 
yeah, and they're not showing signs of it, um, we let a lot of fish go. Yeah. So I think, Ryan, um, just to kind of wrap up the business of fishing, you're involved um, not by accident, but by choice in being part of one of the biggest uh, billion dollar industries in the world, fishing with whatever side you sit on, whether it's recreational or professional. Um, your mission with Karen is to provide, you know, an insight to expertise and skills that empower people to fish smarter and carry that legacy on. It's a legacy project. Yep. Uh, that's become commercially extremely viable. You've had some challenges, uh, as anyone does, um, building a business and keeping it going. Now you've got all the staff. What's next for Ryan and Karen Moody? What's what's on the horizon uh, or on your GPS at the moment? Um, well, we would like to get some more courses knocked out. Um, we have been a little bit slack. Well, we haven't been slack in building extra courses. It's the fact that building all uh, the free content. So we give a lot of free content out mm -hmm. as well. There's, we understand there's people out there who, who cannot afford too much. And that's what our blogs are. We've got lots of tips and we get emails all the time. People saying, oh, I've got so much out of your blogs. Look at the fish I've caught. Yeah. And they send through a few photo photos or totally. barrel or something YouTube. like that. Yeah, YouTube yeah. videos, you know, even like putting round sinkers on near structure point because it pops out easier, things like that. Like tiny little things are game changing, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. And of course, if we're helping people with our free stuff, you can imagine what the boys, everyone Absolutely. in the courses are doing. So, yeah. Yeah. So, you, I know that you guys have got the beautiful big boat too, and you want to go up to Cooktown and do some traveling and just kind of blend filming, but without the pressure and and give yeah. yourselves a bit of well being time together as a couple and, and enjoy nature. I would say without a schedule that if I was to, to extract from what I got off you off the boat, you're just dying to be able to go fishing without a schedule. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's why we want to knock over a few more courses that I, ex with, that's got my expertise. Um, and, uh, and, and we're starting to do a lot more travel fishing, travel blogs now as well, moving away from the tips a little bit, still doing a few tips as well. Uh, there's only so many free tips you can give away without giving out the really, really juicy stuff. So that's what we're basically doing now is we're just going to do a lot more fishing travel, uh, enjoy ourselves a lot more as well. And um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's crossed our mind to do a, a fishing show. Um, we've kind of looked into it a little bit, but these days, we, I don't know if we'll go through the networks. We'll probably do one on our own private channel. Yeah. Uh, no, no sponsorship, no ads, that, that kind of thing. And uh, if we do decide to go ahead with this um, and because, you know, to, to put a fishing show up now, you have to gain so much sponsorship because back in the day, the networks actually, they paid you these yeah. days, you got to pay you the network yeah. to get your show featured. You know, um, that's why a lot of the guys on the fishing shows now it's all sponsorship and it's all ads and mm -hmm. everything like that. And they, they can't help that. They've got to do it. And um yeah, they need that money each year to not only get their production costs covered, but to also try and make a little bit out of it at the end and pay the, the network. So, yeah. so I don't think we'll go down that road. We'll probably start our own private channel, like a subscription type thing, mm -hmm. uh, if we do that. So, yeah, yeah. It's, it's more about us starting to relax a little bit more, make life a bit easier, um, and because uh, we are getting on and... That's what we basically want to do is a lot more travel and that kind of stuff. And we've almost got the business at the stage with our staff. We've got seven, six, seven staff now. And they're wearing a lot of our caps that we used to wear. And as our income has increased over the years, we take off the cap and give it to someone else. And that's what's happened. And now I don't, we don't, I don't edit anymore. Um, we've got our videographer who does all the filming. So we don't, yep. we don't come back without the sound of missing. Yeah. And, well, Larry. it just means you can concentrate on being you. I don't see yeah. you hanging up the fishing rod anytime soon, Ryan. Oh, no. I think when you're, when you're living your purpose, you can't help it. It's like I always say to people, I wish I could just go pack groceries at the IGA. But when, you're, when it's something from within, there's just, you can't help it. It's who you are, right? It's extension of who you are. So will, you'll naturally find your inlets to yes. keep providing value and sharing. And that's... So whatever your next natural part of your journey will be, will be become how people can connect with you there. And you've created legacy content that's timeless that will have future generations. And I know that what we're going to do next is we're going to do a little express episode on men's mental health and legacy and 
and creating your internal viability. So I want to save that subject for that express episode together. But I do want to thank you. And I want to say, what's two pieces of advice um, when you think about what you've learned setting up your business and in your relationships and work and dealing with people that steal your ideas and all those things that can kind of be a sense of betrayal for anyone that's trying to just do the right thing. What would be two pieces of advice you'd give anyone that's listened to your story today on the show, wherever they are, who's going, maybe I could actually, you know, start something. And how would you say you've got to follow through? What are your two pieces of advice, Ryan? Ooh, um, well, be yourself, I guess. Um, don't create fake personas. Don't lie. Um, you get If you get caught out lying, mate, you might as well throw it all away. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, that kind of thing um and also you know the challenges that face you like social media and and things like that um the trolls how to deal with that kind of thing and you just gotta it, it's hard to start with and even for me to start with it, it was difficult as well but um I, I soon learned that hey 99 percent of your comments people love you but that one comment why listen to it yeah you know you obviously that person's got it in for you because I don't know, his upbringing or they're jealous whatever, or yeah. whatever it is, you know, they've lost their mojo. Yeah. And, um, and, and you know, you get that. And, and these days, you know, it's easy to deal with. I just, oh, okay, mate, no worries. Yeah. <laughs> whatever you want. Yeah. yeah. But you need yeah. a strategy for your teams and for your family too, don't you? Like, mm. you can't, I think we had this old adage, which is just let water off a duck's back or, you know, um, but at the end of the day, you do have to have a strategy for life, just like you have to have a strategy for fishing. You need a strategy for your business, the ability to, to sit down on that GPS of your business and, you know, look at what you're doing and be efficient rather than going around in circles and watch your future game plan and, and not going out in shitty conditions. You know, checking all yeah. the forecast, I think, are great analogies from fishing for running a business. It's just before you stick your head out the door, maybe go and check what the weather's doing and who else is out there and everything else and and yeah. trust your own st- strategies and get informed. And you've obviously done that. You've put the work in and that speaks for itself. So, Ryan, I know what we want to do is wrap this up because it's had a long, beautiful episode and a great insight to many of you that have been watching Ryan Moody or a part of the Barra or the Sound of Skills or all the courses on ryanmoodyfishing.com. Um, I think this is a great man behind the scenes chat and couple behind the scenes of what you've really tried to do is to create a quality, solid, long-term legacy product that you're really proud of, Um, you know, and that passion behind doing the right thing comes through. And that I think is a really great thing to end on and to say, Ryan, thank you for sharing some personal sides of the story as well. And I'm going to dive deeper into the mental health stuff shortly. You can find more about Ryan and all his courses on YouTube, on their website, on Facebook, the community. I mean, he's everywhere. Just Google Ryan Moody and it will point you there. Free blogs. I think there's one with me on it tomorrow. God forbid. I didn't even know you were filming that day, you cheeky (laughs) devil. Um, And I can say from my point of view, you know, if you are in a family environment and you are willing to learn and create, then there's nothing better than seeing your partner or your whole family get into a subject that can create a combination of nature and learning and legacy. And there's no greater way than to enjoy nature's playground and give back to our oceans and bring fish home to cook for dinner without being greedy. You've given us the strategies to do that. You've built an empire uh, single-handedly with your wife um, and you should be really proud and thank you for taking the time out um, luckily your boat's getting repaired at the moment otherwise it would have been hard to get hold of you um, <laughs> to be on the show and just one personal mantra just as we sign off Ryan Moody Fishing what's your personal mantra that you kind of like to live by do you have one um, yeah just be honest be true and don't rip people off keep your nose clean basically and life's a lot easier (laughs) yeah so run your side of the street ladies and gentlemen this is nikki fogden moore on radical self-belief the mojo maker podcast talking leadership and life building an empire with fishing guru aka the fishing god ryan moody ryanmoodyfishing.com we'll put all the links in the show notes on nikki fogden moore we'd love to hear how you enjoyed this episode please like and subscribe across all the podcast channels and leave us a review we're eternally grateful and until next time you 
you remember that you're in the driver's seat of life. Uh, Stay healthy, wealthy and wise. And thank you for tuning in. Thanks so much for tuning in. Like and subscribe on YouTube. And also we'd love to have you come over and subscribe to Radical Self-Belief, the podcast. We hope you've reignited your vision and showing you how to harness your effortless energy to be the CEO of your business as well as your life. Thank you.